Hello and welcome to the Rogers Brief for October 22nd, 2023. I'm Adam Rogers. Thank you for watching and thank you for listening. Got some interesting stories this week in the Rogers Brief, including we have a lawyer in Alberta that did not want to take the oath of allegiance and in fact took the matter all the way to court. We have a small claims adjudicator in Nova Scotia who got his knuckles wrapped a little bit. Looked like a personality clash with a senior defense lawyer in Sydney and uh, that was appealed and went to the Supreme Court of Nova Scotia uh, so an interesting little decision there I'm going to take a little time uh, or talk about some uh, the indigenous fishery and a lot of uh, indigenous fishers are before the courts in Nova Scotia now and that's been uh, covered by uh, CBC as well as uh, Maureen Gugo with her uh, news site and then uh, talk about uh, artificial intelligence. There's a notice this week from the courts of Nova Scotia about the use of artificial intelligence in uh, briefs, other kinds of uh, submissions to the courts in Nova Scotia. So uh, a word of caution and guidance uh, coming from our courts. So a couple of things to touch on first though, just look internationally. Every once in a while I feel compelled to take a look down south and see what's going on and what's going on this week in the uh, Trump trials, Trump cases, the indictments, uh, four of them at this point. This one deals with uh, the case out of Georgia. Allegations that President Trump, former President Trump, put pressure on Georgia state officials to come up with, create, identify evidence of voter fraud and election fraud in that state and thus justify the switching of the state electors over from now President Biden to former President Trump in the 2020 election. Okay, so uh, in, under the heading of things that would happen in the U.S. but would not happen in Canada, what happened this week? Two of Trump's co-accused, those being also his lawyers at the time, Sidney Powell. People may recognize Sidney Powell. She's been on television numerous times if you've watched any of the U.S. news and Kenneth Cheesebro, unfortunate name there, his lawyers and co-defendants. So at the time, uh, during, you know, the aftermath of the election in 2020, these individuals were identified. Whenever they were on TV or whenever they were in the news, they were ad identified as Trump's lawyers. Well, uh, now the claim from the government is that they were they were not acting as legal advisors but as political advisors and thus they're uh, liable to you know they or they don't they don't benefit from the protection that you might get from uh, status as as legal counsel all right so what does that mean uh, these two have now pled guilty and have agreed to sentences that involves several years of probation but no jail time no fines actually i think sorry cancel that on the fines there may be some fines involved but no jail time and as part of that deal each of them have agreed to testify truthfully to uh, what they did what they knew and in miss powell's case in particular uh, there's, well, she she had direct contact with the former president in developing the strategy or, or in discussing the issues of the Georgia election, and so uh, it'd be interesting to see what she comes out with and if that changes anything for the uh, I think 18 other defendants as well as former President Trump. So uh, that's going on in the states. Uh, out in Saskatchewan, uh, this uh, just quickly following up on uh, things I've been covering with the Parental Bill of Rights, the legislation on uh, uh, gender affirming pronouns and all these things in schools for uh, p students aged under under the age of 16 years old. So that uh, Bill of Rights, par Parents' Bill of Rights in Saskatchewan has passed the legislature this week and after an emergency session, 40 hours of debate on the bill mostly occupied by opposition members saying that it was an improper bill. Uh, but it's been passed now. It's been um, signed by the lieutenant governor there and now is the law in Saskatchewan. Interesting little uh, addition to this law, in addition to um, ensuring that 
if anybody's if any student under the age of 16 is going to use a new or chosen name or pronoun then they need to have parental consent well in addition to that schools also need to are required to fly the flag of saskatchewan at their schools so i guess that wasn't uh wasn't the law or maybe people felt it wasn't being done sufficiently uh, thoroughly who knows anyway so that's uh that's happened in saskatchewan we're still following the legal case which looks like had been scheduled for a hearing in november that is now pushed back to 2024 as the government has changed lawyers from their internal department of justice lawyers to an external law firm and so that's led to a delay in the hearings this thing i'll note has uh, been now five years since october 18th 2018 which was when uh, cannabis was legalized in Canada. Still heavily regulated in most provinces. What's uh, happened is that it's in the, the liquor stores or special uh, cannabis dispensaries authorized by the government. Unless you're on First Nation property and then it's, uh, at least in Nova Scotia, fairly unregulated as a market uh, with some efforts to uh, enforce laws, but seemingly very little effort uh, so we'll see where that goes uh, certainly society hasn't fallen apart in the last five years since uh, cannabis has become legalized hard to know where the usage rates have gone up the data wasn't so great from before it was legalized because people wouldn't always answer truthfully about uh, their usage all right so uh, some just some quick uh, quick hits there following as well uh, i've covered this the last few weeks the ottawa convoy trial with uh, chris Barber and uh, Tamara Litch. Not much happened this week. Uh, some disclosure issues have come up again with uh, some police officers who had text threads talking with, uh, there was a, a liaison officer for the Ottawa police speaking with uh, Miss Litch, communicating back and forth. Some of those messages have been deleted and so uh, they're seeing what they can do about that uh, problem with disclosure, but uh, otherwise things have just gone ahead this week. Nothing terribly significant otherwise. We'll keep an eye on that, though. All right, so uh, interesting case out of Alberta this week. A Dalhousie uh, Law School graduate, uh, Prabjit Singh Wuring, W-I-R-R-I-N-G, challenged the mandatory oath of allegiance to the sovereign, which is required under the Legal Profession Act in Alberta. It's the same thing in Nova Scotia. If you want to become a lawyer, practicing lawyer, you need to swear allegiance to the uh well the king now at the time with mr Waring, it was the queen so he was alleging that his charter right to religious freedom and equality was violated by requiring a mandatory oath in order to join the profession now Waring is a sikh and says that he can only pledge allegiance to a divine being not uh, the queen or now king charles who are uh, in a sense, I guess a representative of the Anglican Church, but uh, certainly not divine and not uh, no connection to the Sikh religion. So uh, I took that to the Alberta Supreme Court, the Court of Queen's King's Bench, sort of Court of King's Bench now, and Justice Barbara Johnson said, uh, no, you need to take the oath. This oath is not literally an oath to a person, the Queen in the case when it was first brought to court, Rather, it is a symbolic uh, position. And you are making an oath to um, the crown, broadly speaking, the crown which represents, in this case, the rule of law and the Canadian constitutional system, the crown, uh, not the queen as a political or a religious entity. And so uh, Mr. Waring will need to take the oath if he wishes to practice law in Alberta. Does not appear to be practicing law in Alberta at the moment. I looked on the Alberta Law Society lawyers directory, every province. If you're looking for a lawyer anywhere in Canada, check their provincial uh, law society website and you'll see a link to a directory of lawyers that are practicing in each province. And in Alberta, you will not find Prabjit Singh Waring uh, practicing at this time. So we'll see. Uh, what he does with that decision, appeals it. I can't see why you would appeal that decision. Uh, just take the oath and try to practice law as you see fit. 
Okay. Little Nova Scotia connection there where we went to Dalhousie, but uh, this ne the next few cases are uh, all Nova Scotia related to the next uh, four stories. The next one I want to talk about is Halifax Examiner's coverage of the Randy Riley trial. I mentioned this last week, and what's happening is the main witness in that trial, and you remember that Randy Riley was found not guilty after three and a half hours of deliberation by a jury, very short time deliberating, which included uh, a lunch break. And the main witness was Caitlin Fuller, who was the girlfriend of the person who admitted to the killing for which Randy Riley had been falsely convicted. So she was in the witness protection program and had uh, milked that program to the tune of 630 some thousand dollars after testifying or after claiming that Randy Riley had threatened her. Now there's no evidence, uh, you know, the, no, we don't know exactly what the jury's uh, thought about this, but the Crown made a uh, pitch during the case that because she was in the witness protection program, that bolstered her credibility. The defense said because she's been milking this program that it hurts her credibility and she's only there for the money. And the jury seems to have agreed with the defense position on that. Of course, we don't know exactly what juries decide because that's not public in the same way a judge's decision would be reasoned out, written out, and published. So the situation now, though, is that the Halifax Examiner, Tim Bousquet, the uh, publisher, reported on the case, and then there was a publication ban in place for Miss Fuller. You weren't allowed to describe what she looked like or publish any photos of her. The Examiner did not do either of those things. The Federal Crown is now seeking a very unusual publication ban, a retroactive publication ban, which would make the actions that have already taken place, the articles that have already been published, illegal and criminal. Now, Justice Arnold, in the uh, hearing on this question, said that he's not aware of any precedents that, uh, where that's been the case, where a judge has ordered this retroactive-style publication ban and apparently the Federal Crown, uh, Jan Jensen, uh, 2009 call to the bar, uh, has not provided any precedents. Instead, uh, Crown uh, Jensen has filed a sealed and heavily redacted affidavit explaining uh, why the judge should issue the order. And in, so Mr. Bousquet asks, okay, let me know which particular provisions in the articles you're talking about, and we can make you know have a discussion of as to whether those would tend to either identify Miss Fuller or uh, delve into the witness protection program to the extent that people would know too much about it and be able to sort out how they operate, and thus you know it would undermine the undermine the effectiveness of the witness protection program. Bousquet says that uh, the argument from the Crown was that they were not relying on anything specific in the articles, but rather what they called the mosaic effect. In other words, no specific piece of information, but rather the totality of the article or articles would tend to be uh, to rev revealing as to how the operate how the system operates with the witness protection program Bousquet says no this is a case of embarrassment because they spent so much money on Miss Fuller and she was a terrible witness and was probably lying the whole time and they're embarrassed about it and they're they don't want those kinds of details out there not at all that they're worried about a protection of a witness I tend to agree with that I suspect the judge is not going to issue any kind of a retroactive publication ban. The details are already out there. They've been published. If people, uh, you know, you, it's very difficult to go back and retroactively uh, ban something. So uh, we'll see where that goes. The decision uh, was expected to come out Friday. I didn't see any reporting on it, and so we'll, uh, we'll wait for that decision, hopefully this week. Next thing I wanted to talk about, this is a case... Well, the case is in the Supreme Court of Nova Scotia, Justice Chipman, 
allowed an appeal from the small claims court out of Sydney. The case is called George versus LeBlanc. These details aren't all that important in a sense, but it was the original small claims case was for about $7,500. It involves the sale of a trailer. Apparently the claimant is a former police officer. Um, but again, those details are not so important to this story. Justice Chipman was very critical of adjudicator Tuma Young, uh, KC, uh, teaches at uh, Cape Breton University, former president of the Nova Scotia Barrister Society, recently uh, president of the Nova Scotia Barrister Society, sits on many committees, he's all over the place uh, giving uh, talks on, on um, leadership and all these things. Anyway, okay, so very... Uh, seem to be a, a clash of personalities in small claims court. So what happened? Small claims court scheduled this matter for a telephone hearing on April 19th of this year, 2023. David Iannetti, who's a defense counsel, has been practicing law for 33 years, says uh, this should be an in-person hearing. In all my years of practicing, he said that he never had uh, a hearing done by telephone and in particular in this case because credibility was an issue that it should be done in person how can you assess credibility over the phone it's much more difficult than doing so in person uh, adjudicator to young disagreed said if you want an in-person hearing you're gonna have to file this in Supreme Court so there is a, a mechanism if you choose Crucially, if the claimant chooses to take a matter to uh, Supreme Court, you can do so. If the defendant files a counterclaim, again, uh, you can make the application to take it to Supreme Court. But uh, So what, what happened, the way the, the first night ended was the adjudicator saying to David Iannetti, well, if you want a, an in-person hearing, take this to Supreme Court. Ionetti goes and figures it out the next day that he cannot do that. He emails the adjudicator staff to, to the small claims court, says that's not possible. Let's have an in-person hearing, as I mentioned, for all the reasons I mentioned. And Tuma Young says, nope, uh, you, and scheduled a phone call for the 26th, so a week later. Ionetti uh, wrote to the court that day, said, no, this is not right. I object for all those reasons that I've discussed, and I'm not calling in. He did, did not call in. So the adjudicator granted judgment to the plaintiff for almost $7,500. So the limit at small claims court is $25,000, but $7,500 is not nothing. Justice Chipman says that was an error in law. First of all, you can't just issue a quick judgment in a case where the defen defendant has filed a defense and has clearly indicated an intention to defend the case. Uh, you can adjourn it, you can do other things, but you know you can't just file a, a quick judgment in that case. Uh, and just didn't think it was uh, so, and also Justice Chipman said that it, what should have happened was scheduled for an in-person hearing. So since the pandemic, this is what's been happening, right? So they were started doing hearings by uh, small claims court hearings by telephone many cases are simple they don't involve uh, findings of credibility a lot of the time people don't show up anyway and so you just issue things and you do it quickly by phone you don't have to have court staff in you don't have to open the buildings all those things it's it's quicker it's more it's less expensive more convenient but in a case like this where credibility is an issue, you have to do it in person. Um, pretty uh, petty on the part of adjudicator Tumi Young not to allow that to happen. Um, Bob Dylan would say, pettiness that plays so rough. So now what's going to happen following the decision of Justice Chipman is there's going to be a new hearing before a different small claims court adjudicator to determine the issue expensive uh, for the LeBlancs who are defending this $7,500 claim. I'm sure they spent more than that on David Iannetti from the initial hearings, 
the appeal, successful appeal, but you're not going to get your cost back on that. You get a percentage, but not the whole amount. And now the new hearing. So we'll, uh, we'll see if anything else develops from that. I don't know if small claims court decisions are not always reported, so we may not know what comes of this one. So uh, another big story that came out, well, a little just uh, just a week ago, and I've been watching is this. It's a a story within a story. This is a larger issue of fishers, uh, uh, indigenous fishery. What's happening on the water? A lot of uncertainty, a lot of tension, turmoil, and uh, well, and some viol violence in some cases. So. Since September 17th of 2020, the Sebeg and Agadee First Nation started what they call a self-regulated fi lobster fishery. Issued, I think, three communal licenses within the band. And this is all 21 years, this was 21 years after the Marshall decision, which affirmed the treaty right for Indigenous uh, Canadians to hunt and fish for a moderate livelihood. Now, I've said uh, before in other venues that the Governments over the years have really resisted defining moderate livelihood as a term and have really, I guess, tried to tamper expectations when it comes to what that should mean. So there have been uh, now recently in the last couple of years, you know, confrontations, protests, riots, arson of lobster pounds, two of them. And DFO has seized about 7,000 traps from uh, First Nations fishermen. And so now there are 54 active cases ongoing. And Maureen uh, Gugu has listed these 54 cases and some details on them on her website. These to do with lobsters, elver, the elver fishery, obstruction of fisheries officer allegations, fishing outside the season, and fishing without authorization allegations. Now, some of the cases there have been constitutional challenges some of those cases the indications are that the lawyers started the constitutional challenge and then withdrew it which tells me because a constitutional challenge is a complicated thing to do it takes a lot of time it's an expensive undertaking even though in many cases particularly these kinds of cases i think it would be their best option their best defense but you know if you're making many thousands of dollars with the lobster fishery, then you can hire a lawyer to do these kind of claims. But, you know, if you're just getting by and you're, you don't have a lot of money to uh, fund a defense, then that's a problem. I'm a little surprised that the bands themselves are not supporting the fishers financially. They don't seem to be. Uh, there should be some, in my view anyway, a consolidation of some of these cases and an effort from the bands to fund them properly and make sure that there's a proper uh, constitutional challenge put before the courts. Over the one of the lessons over the last 30 years, I think that Indigenous uh, Canadians can can take is that their greatest successes have come through the court systems. They've had real hard time getting uh, any momentum behind government negotiations been some successes recently of course but uh, you know with some um, communal fishing licenses taken uh, taken out and, and authorized but uh, still more negotiation to take place that's what uh, Naomi Metallic uh, law professor at Dalhousie has said the federal government should be negotiating not prosecuting so we'll keep an eye on some of these cases like I say uh, the constitutional challenges uh, if they're done properly would lay out many of these issues and make, make the negotiations easier if, uh, if the issues are, you know, litigated and argued before courts and then you at least have those, those arguments available and some decisions available to uh, use as guidance in the negotiations. But aside from that, that uh, those negotiations should be ongoing now. A lot of tension all over the place. You hear from fishermen, I do at least uh, quite often about uh, problems on the water and on the wharf. So hopefully that gets resolved uh, through negotiations and not through uh, violence or protracted litigation. Okay, last thing I want to mention, artificial intelligence. We hear about this a lot in different contexts and people worried about their professions and how this is all going to go. Well, guess what? Uh, 
the legal profession, which a person might think is, oh, well, they, you know, they make unusual arguments and they've got to cross-examine and everything's very particularized. Uh, no, uh, actually, it seems to be one of the first targets for artificial intelligence is the legal profession. So, uh, seeing some law societies or courts put these warnings out or, or advisories out, the Nova Scotia Court, uh, Supreme Court is urging caution. They have, uh, they have a notice on ensuring the integrity of court submissions when using generative artificial intelligence. So this is your chat GPTs and, and the like. It says, uh, you should, first of all, rely on authoritative sources. There's been news articles, I've read things about where artificial intelligence will take legitimate sources, but then they'll just make stuff up. <laughs> they'll make up stuff that looks like a legitimate case, but it's just a case that doesn't exist. So it says they there should be a human in the loop that in other words submissions must be verified with meaningful human control all right so you can get your ai program to write your 40 page uh, factum or brief but you must read it over and make sure the citations are correct and the law and the arguments make sense and are arguments that you would have made yourself uh, or that you feel at least you can justify in uh, in oral submissions all right, so uh, those are the cases I wanted to cover this week. Some interesting things. I always keep an eye out on the cases that are uh, released from the uh, Nova Scotia Court, Supreme Court, uh, the Court of Appeal, Family Division, whatever may be of interest, and, uh, and cover those for you. And uh, I'll be back next week to do the same. Be on uh, nighttime tonight with uh, Jordan Bonaparte and Paul Palango to talk about some interesting cases too. Some of these, but uh, more... Uh, some interesting stuff from across the country. We'll leave it at that and hope to uh, hope that you'll be able to join us live on YouTube at quarter after 9 p.m. Uh, tonight. Check out the nighttime podcast on YouTube for the, the links to all that. All right, so otherwise, uh, thanks again for watching and thank you for listening and we'll see you next time.